Most of you probably know me as a collection of two-dimensional pixels on your screen. So I hope it's okay that today we're just going to chat for a little bit about my real life career update and uh, also talk to you a little bit about how I came up with the program for my next live stream concert, which is in four days. Do you guys hear the birds? Part of me is very scared that my camera will just fall off my balcony. But maybe it's just because I'm super, super early right now talking to you on camera. And that's just the kind of things that I say and worry about. It's not every day that I wake up at 5.30 in the morning to film. Actually, I never do this except for one time in my life so far. The only reason that I have to do it at this time is because I have been trying to save all of my energy for practicing and for the piano. Today is Tuesday. So yeah, four days until my concert. So I try to spend most of my day just being at the piano or just not having to do anything else other than either relaxing or practicing. And if I filmed this later in the day, I will look like a zombie, even though right now I probably don't look that much more awake, but here it is, 7 a.m. filming. I did want to make this video because it's a very interesting time in my life right now. Currently, we have 252,000 subscribers on YouTube, and that's a lot of eyes. It's easy to think of it as a number, but it's a little bit hard for me to I don't know, come to terms with the fact that there are 252 pairs of eyes in the world. 252,000 pairs of eyes in the world. Possibly watching this, or just kind of know my existence. But anyway. Oh, and you know that I am still in New York City because you can hear sirens, but not as loud as before. First off, I want to say thank you for growing so much as a YouTube family. I really appreciate you for supporting me throughout this entire weird I don't want to use the word difficult because personally I know I have been so privileged to have your support your support here on YouTube and also those of you who have been supporting me on Patreon so it actually has been less difficult than it could have been for me during this pandemic being on lockdown and I really appreciate you for creating a space for me to continue being creative this entire time doing what I love and care and sharing classical music. So I want to start off by saying thank you. Something that has been on my mind a lot in the past few days, but also just reflecting on my life during this pandemic and lockdown situation for, I don't know how many months, six months or something like that, is being a 2D person versus if there's even a difference, a 3D person. And right now, we're in a very exciting, interesting time where I am transitioning into the 3D world. So I won't be living on YouTube for every single minute of my day or every single day of the week <laughs> because I feel like for the past six months, I've just been living on YouTube and existing on YouTube. And, um, well, that's not really where I live. I live in the real world of trying to be an actual pianist on the stage and performing on stage. And I realize that a lot of you probably only joined my channel during the time when I solely, exclusively <laughs> lived through the camera in my apartment. So that's why a few days before we reached quarter of a million subscribers, I wrote a letter that I posted everywhere on social media. Just in case you're one of the new subscribers who came to my YouTube. I started making YouTube videos in 2017 because I sensed a lack of human connection between classical music and the audience. A connection that is so vital to keeping music alive. No one knew what goes on with classical musicians on stage, and composers have been long dead for centuries. So I found that classical music had become something very distant and dehumanized. Lose the human, you lose the art. This thought occurred to me in a philosophical aesthetics class at college. So that's how this all started. This vlogging enterprise, do I call it enterprise? I don't know what to call it. This vlogging part of my life really started from that concept of just me trying to be the bridge between classical music 
and the audience. As I saw the numbers go up, I think I was getting nervous about growing so much on YouTube. It's not a complaint, I mean, it's amazing. So of course, I'm very grateful. And I know that a lot of you experience me <laughs> and uh, experience classical music just on YouTube and that's great. I mean, it's great that YouTube has become a platform so easily accessible for you to experience and even dip your toes in classical music. But I wrote that letter because I wanted to explain to you that YouTube has always been intended to be a bridge between classical music and audience and I'm just in the middle. Yeah, I just didn't want to disappoint you or betray you by perpetuating some sort of false expectation that I would forever be on YouTube. Something that I never really talked about, I guess publicly maybe? I don't know. I feel like I have never really addressed this directly, but classical music and YouTube are very, very different worlds and they don't really go well together. So it's actually very tricky and a fine line for me to walk on such that I would be respected in the classical music world, but still be able to connect with you on YouTube. I feel like for the past six months, I have been lopsided all the way on the YouTube world because obviously I have no other choice, but I'm very excited that in four days, I will be walking that fine line again and beat a bridge because in four days, I will be performing on a stage again. And that's very exciting. I will no longer be just a 2D person filming in the apartment and playing. I have been invited, I mean, I've talked about this quite a bit on my other social media, but I've never really talked to you in uh, human voice. I've put in captions, but never really addressed it. I've been invited to perform on DreamStage, a new video platform that was created by actually a friendly face that you have met here on YouTube if you have followed me for a while. Chell is Jan Vogler. We have played quite a few times. You've seen him on my YouTube. Can you please explain what DreamStage is? DreamStage, well, it was born out of the pandemic. It was born out of these 24-hour streams where you also, Tiffany, you participated and played so wonderfully and was also, you were a wonderful co-host, remember? To my big surprise, people reacted so with so much emotion to these streams. We got so much feedback and so many people wrote messages and WhatsApp messages and Facebook messages. And I really, for days, I was reading these emails and everything. And then I thought, okay, we have to do something uh, to connect the artists with their audience and a real virtual concert hall, something that is a destination, that is a beautiful place with a lot of fantasy and is beautiful, that can stream in HD, that can help artists and that is really um, maybe a place where the real concert halls like in New York, the Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center all shut down. Nobody can even enter this virtual place opens it, it, its doors. What we really want to do, we want to connect with the, um, through the artists, uh, with all the fans of music and help uh, everyone understand that without a virtual stage like this, most musicians won't be able to survive this fall because all the concert halls are closed. And if nobody can play concerts and uh, also make some money, uh, music will die. And I think we have to uh, counter act. I feel the urge to now in the time when some people are frozen and actually don't know really how to go on to actually um, really um, act and do something. And I've always uh, thought that if I want uh, to help the music, I have to help the whole musical community, not just myself. Because I think the danger is that we think only about our audience or our concert, but we have to think about all our friends. And then we help, will help all our friends and musician friends, but also ourselves, and also have the joy to play for the wonderful audience. Now, I'm sorry I talked so long. <laughs> it's like you read my mind. But I mean, no, that just shows that you're really enthusiastic about this and you can't stop talking about it, which is good. So that's a good thing. Thank you. I mean, it's a little bit similar how, uh, why I want to donate my proceeds to help the music community. Currently, I have been trying to raise funds for classical musicians who have been affected by COVID and also music education. Sweet Relief has been helping musicians since 1994, and in recent years, we also opened our doors to music industry workers. This includes managers, tour managers, crew, and venue workers, anyone from ticket takers to bar backs who are also struggling trying to make ends meet. Recently, due to the pandemic, we created the COVID-19 Fund. This is to help all musicians and music industry workers who have lost work due to cancellations and rescheduled tours. 
my favorite class is Midorian Friends. It is the highlight of my day. Midorian Friends brings me happiness and fun every day. What makes Apollo Music Project special is the way we really get to know the children. They really get to know us and you're taking something which is in a sense is ours, our music, our understanding of music, and sharing it with the children. Well done. We never tell them what to think. We want to know what they think, how the children respond to music themselves, the stories they hear in the music, the things it reminds them of. The goal is to raise $10,000, which, you know, it's not that surprising for you to find out that I'm trying to fundraise with live stream concerts because I've done that twice already and we raised over $27,000. So I'm trying to do the same thing pretty much for musicians and education because I feel like it's time for me to help out my colleagues and just people closer to my world and because I know this has been a very tough time for a lot of, lot of music industry people and this is my way of trying to help a little bit. So if we don't reach the $10,000 goal from just selling the merch and from donations to my charity together with Classical, I will donate however much necessary from my ticketing proceeds from DreamStage to the fundraiser goal. Eating Tiffany here. <clears throat> I uh, forgot to mention, the reason you're seeing merchandise below my YouTube videos lately, it's because I'm trying to fundraise for my charity together with Classical. But I just wanted to tell you that I'm not profiting from the proceeds of the merchandise. It's all going to charity. If I perform on YouTube, it's just by myself and I exist in the whole world outside of classical music. But with DreamStage, because it is run by such high profile people in the classical music world, and also I have been invited to be along the lines of other really top classical musicians, it puts me more in the middle again. And I am no longer just by myself in the pop culture YouTube world. I am kind of going back to the classical music world, which is actually the perfect time for me because after dream stage, there will be more stuff where I will be over there <laughs> again and I can continue making my YouTube the behind the scenes channel I was so stressed out so stressed out I broke down so many times trying to get everything together for those two live stream concerts I talked about this in the letter I'm not going to dwell on that anymore because onto the positives <laughs> so that's why I'm very excited that I will just have to play on the stage and not have to worry about tech or any other factors that have nothing to do with music playing because when I had to manage everything by myself, I wasn't really completely an artist when I was playing. I was so many different other things and it just took away my pure experience if there is a pure experience of playing the piano. So I hope you understand why I have been promoting so much about the stream stage live stream concert. Whoa, pigeons! <laughs> Sorry, I got kind of scared that pigeons were gonna fly in my face and possibly into my apartment. <laughs> anyway. I don't even profit off of tickets for my regular concerts. And I don't have to stress out about audio and video because there's actually going to be a professional team of cameramen and audio engineer. I hope you're excited for me that I will start to belong in the classical world again. And uh, don't worry, I will still make YouTube videos, but it will be back to get ready with me vlogs. So that will be the next vlog that I'll be making. It'll just be behind the scenes stuff, which is how I started all of this vlogging. So I think that's the first part. Basically, I will no longer be a 2D person. I will be a 3D person in the world, in the classical music world, again. Yay! I mean, it's not that dramatic. I really am moving on from YouTube into the classical world, so it's not a clickbait or anything. Next part is about my live stream concert program, which some of you asked about. And I'm excited to tell you about it because I spent so, so much time on this but I really just wanted to make this worth your money and make it super 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 special and unlike any of my other YouTube live streams before so this is my program 
I decided on a 40-40 minute, <laughs> like a normal, regular concert with an intermission. The first half consists of entirely Mozart pieces. There are a few reasons for this. One, it is very rare that I have an opportunity to play anything I want in a concert, and particularly Mozart. I have pitched Mozart previously. I mean, I'm not saying that all concert presenters reject Mozart, but there is a certain stigma against play Mozart and the idea that Mozart is very easy, therefore you don't want to play Mozart to showcase yourself, whether in auditions or competitions or in concerts. And especially at the stage where I am still building up my career and really trying to establish myself as a higher and higher classical pianist, I don't want to jeopardize and have people think that I am just a little girl playing Mozart. But because Dream Stage is founded by a colleague who is very sympathetic and actually encouraged me to play more classical stuff. I decided that this would be the perfect opportunity for me to play Mozart. But there's also more reasons why I chose to play Mozart. Every time when I play live streams, there seems to be a lot of interest and ask for me to play Mozart. But the problem is, Mozart is the one composer that I can never play on live streams by myself on the regular social media platforms because I always get flagged for copyrights, even though they are invalid copyrights. But with live streams, for example, on Instagram, I've done this before, I've tested where I play Mozart, it would just abruptly stop my live stream. So I don't want to prepare a Mozart program for a YouTube live stream in the past and then be cut off. That would be so bad <laughs> because I wouldn't realize at the moment I would be annoying thousands of people. So I didn't want to have that fear constantly in my head that I would be cut off in the middle of playing Mozart on YouTube. But with Dream Stage, there's no copyright monster <laughs> behind the algorithm or the video platform. Third reason that I chose Mozart is because it is not easy to play Mozart and I thought this would be a chance for me to challenge myself. Ironically, it is not easy to play Mozart because it's very easy <laughs> to play in a way that's very unnatural because it is so simple in its pure writing. It's very easy to be over-seasoned. Does that make sense? I'm thinking of food. Maybe it's because I haven't had breakfast and I'm trying to think of breakfast foods and how you can put too much salt. <laughs> so that explains my first half and uh, why it's all Mozart. Second half was something that I cried a lot over. So I was not kidding when I wrote in my caption that I've never spent so much time struggling on thinking of a program. And I have some proof here, actually. <laughs> I spent a good two weeks, I think, maybe even more than that, trying to figure out what to do with the second half of the concert program. Because I was learning Schumann's second sonata in G minor, and I realized that the second movement is very similar to Mozart's G major sonata. It's uh, only 8.15 or so in the morning, and I never play this before, but because I need to add this clip in, the Mozart second movement starts like this. And the Schumann second movement starts like this. the link there's this pulsating C major kind of feeling going on and yeah both of them go from G to C for the second movement which somehow just established a really interesting link in my head like a musical link. I don't know if anyone will pick this up during a concert but this was my idea that if I'm gonna play a concert with Schumann Sonata and with Mozart I would want the pairing of these two G major Mozart and G minor Schumann. So I knew Schumann Sonata had to be in the second half or somewhere in the concert program. But since I decided on the whole entire Mozart first half, 
Shuman was going to be in the second half, but what else would I compliment Shuman with? This took me the longest time possible. And what I ended up with is actually something that I cannot take full credit for. It's because my music friend reminded me that when Chopin was 17, he wrote a variation on Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. It's on one of the duets, La Cittaram La Mano. I don't speak Italian. Since my first half is Mozart, having that Chopin variations before the Schumann Sonata would be a perfect link because after Chopin wrote that piece, Schumann was super enthusiastic about Chopin's talent regarding that Chopin variations. So with the Mozart link in the first half and the Schumann, having this piece in the middle would be perfect, right? Problem was, five weeks before August 29th, the concert, I never played this piece. I knew about this piece's existence and I knew the storyline, but I just didn't think of it earlier. So I was super mad about myself. I was really nervous about whether I could do this. I was really, 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 really panicking about this because in normal times, five weeks is not such a ridiculous time for me to learn a completely new piece and then perform it. But I was also in the middle of moving, finding a new apartment, stressing out about <laughs> other non-musical things and uh, emotionally distraught over this. Also, I made that sight reading vlog and was scared that people would think I was just filming that sight reading video and saying that I'm going to learn a piece in five weeks just as like a social media thing, challenge to get attention possibly, and that I would be criticized for this. Actually, no one made that criticism, so please don't make this criticism now. After I sight read the piece, even though my brain crashed, after sight reading. If I like this piece, I'm gonna play it. So I decided to learn it. And then Chopin Nocturne, Opus 9, number one. It's just a breather piece between the Chopin and the Schumann. Really dramatic second sonata. I was filming Tiffany here. I forgot to mention that Schumann Arabesque is one of my favorite pieces of Schumann after Carnival, maybe. I don't know, but I really, really, really like that piece. So that explains my program, I think. I put a lot of thought into this. It was also really hard for me to find pieces that you have never ever heard me play before. I hope you will be excited for my 3D life as a concert pianist again. Man, it'll be very strange when I start to travel again because I do have to travel to a location to do this live stream. So there will be some outside of my apartment <laughs> vlogging my first time in many 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 months be kind and keep striving bye thank you for your support my camera didn't fall off the balcony Woohoo! even though there's slight wind here i'm so hungry